Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you on this e-seminar being organized by the EDA and more specifically by the UDOT Working Group, an initiative by the EDA CKD MBD Working Group. Before we go to the e-seminar, I would like to introduce briefly the UDOT initiative. So this initiative was launched something like six years ago in 2017 under the umbrella, next slide please, Matthias, under the umbrella of the EDA CKD MBD Working Group. In a way, its aim was fourfold. Uh, it wants to revitalize bone biopsy as a clinically useful tool in daily practice. It also wants to promote and organize pan-European research in the field of renal osteostrophy. Also wants to closely collaborate with other bone and mineral societies. And last but not least, to improve and distribute knowledge in the field of renal osteodystrophy. At that time, we felt it necessary that the knowledge in the field of renal osteostrophy is improving. And for fulfilling this aim, we uh, organize uh, continuous medical educations, also webinars, we write consensus uh, papers, and finally also organize workshops. For example, uh, we recently published two um, consensus papers. Next slide. The first one probably you have read in between has been published two years ago in NDT is dealing with the topic of uh, osteoporosis and the management of osteoporosis in patients with CKD stage grade 4 to grade 5D. And also proud to announce that another consensus paper has just been published in NDT. And this is, de this is dealing with the recommended calcium intake in adults and children with chronic kidney disease. I really welcome you to uh, go and read this manuscript. It's a very extensive manuscript, but it contains an, an uh, enormous um, mass of information concerning how to deal with calcium. Because up to now, we always have been warning against the dangers of too much calcium, but also too little calcium can be harmful to our patients. Please have a look. And uh, certainly this also will be discussed in the uh, next e-seminar. And this e-seminar, next slide, is something also one of the initiatives we, we took within the uh, UDOT uh, initiative, again, to increase the knowledge in uh, renal osteostrophy. We all know that we can learn from uh, attending webinars. We can also go to lectures. But at the end, it's the case. It's the case itself that's most learnful. And that's the reason why we launched this initiative. We would like to discuss with you cases which are not exceptional, but which are really instructive to how to deal with uh, problems uh, related to CKD and BD, and this in a very interactive way. So we welcome all questions. You can use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You can write your questions. We will deal with them. We hope for a very interactive session, which a case, which as you can see in this session, will deal with a renal transplant candidate case, with an osteoporotic fractures. So if you have a question, please, uh, this question should be related to this case. Uh, but of course, if there's time left, we can also uh, uh, address other more, let's say, general questions with regard to the treatment of CKD, MBD, and more specifically with the treatment of uh, renal bone disease. It's my pleasure to introduce now the panelists. Uh, so we have three panelists, all experienced in the field of bone disease, two nephrologists and one endocrinologist. These are uh, Professor Carrera Ferreira, Carina Ferreira from Portugal. We've also Renata de Jonge from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. She's an endocrinologist with uh, interest also in renal bone disease. And finally, we all know Sandro Mazzofero from uh, Rome as a third panelist that will help us through the discussion. And the speaker of today is Matthias Haarhaus. He is a nephrologist uh, in Stockholm, Karolinska Institute, uh, and also has a long-standing, uh, let's, let's say, expertise in uh, renal osteostrophy. He's also performing actively bone biopsies, and he will present the case today. So we'll have the case presentation. There will be some questions in between. Uh, and you can, again, as said, you can put your questions in the v &A, uh, in the Q&A box below. We'll go through uh, them. And at the end, we'll have a more general discussion of this case. That's my introduction. I would like now to give the floor to, to Matthias to present this uh, case, a renal transplant candidate with an osteoporotic fracture. Matthias. 
Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so welcome everybody to today's uh, e-seminar, which is the first e-seminar in this form, a case discussion. Uh, and I can uh, say that this specific case is a, a real case uh, that we have been treating at Karolinska. We uh, have since many years an interdisciplinary uh, team that uh, gets referrals from all kinds of specialists. And these patients are usually CKD patients, advanced CKD patients with some kind of a renal osteodystrophy or CKD MBD problem. Uh, and this kind of uh, referral unit uh, is popping up now in many different countries. So I uh, uh, believe that this is a way maybe to go forward uh, to disseminate uh, knowledge about CKD MBD uh, to a wider audience. Um, so this patient is a 72 year old female with CKD 5D. Uh, her kidney disease is um, ADPKD and she has uh, known hypertension. She is a smoker, usually half a pack per day. And uh, she is normal weight with a BMI of 20. There's no heredity for low energy fractures. At the age of 69, uh, the patient uh, became dependent on dialysis and was started on peritoneal dial dialysis with a calcium of 1.25 millimole per liter. Uh, at the same time, um, evaluation for kidney transplantation was started. Um, this took some time, I must say, and uh, at the age of 71 years, uh, she was switched to hemodialysis uh, due to diverticulitis. So you can understand there were some clinical complications. They also prolonged her transplant uh, workup. Um, however, um, the... Uh, uh, Oh, yes, and there was also a um, beginning uh, peripheral artery disease. So she had a PTA of her lower limb artery. Uh, but transplant uh, workup com commenced. And uh, as part of that, uh, DEXA was uh, done, uh, which showed that she had osteoporosis with a T-score in total hip of minus 2.5 and a T-score in uh, uh, lumbar spine of minus 2.1 SD. So at this time, her laboratory was, um, and this is values from dialysis start to current, her calcium was 2.35 millimoles per liter to 2.38 millimoles per liter. And I know that we are measuring calcium in different units. So in Sweden, we use the SI units. Uh, you can see here the reference, uh, which is 2.15 to 2.50 millimoles per liter. So her calcium was well controlled and quite stable. Her phosphate, on the other hand, went up from 1.6 at dialysis start, which is slightly above the upper level of normal, to 2.1, which is, it's clearly elevated and above the um, therapeutic range, which is up to 1.7, 1.8. Her IPTH uh, was at dialysis start 17 picomoles per liter, and that is about um, about two and a half times the upper limit of normal. Uh, and it increased to 23, which is about uh, three to four times the upper limit of normal. Alkaline phosphatase was 1.2 microcat per liter and increased to 1.3 microcat per liter. And the reference range is below 1.9 microcat per liter. So this is also, I would say, well-controlled, slight increase, which is not surprising with the slight increase of 
IPTH. But all of these values, except for phosphate, I would say um, are approximately what you would expect and what you would call a well-treated patient. Uh, so what about her treatment? She was on um, a relatively low dose of 1-alpha uh, vitamin D, uh, 0.25 micrograms per day. Uh, this was started prior to the dialysis start, and it was recently stopped due to the increase in phosphate. She was also treated with Sevelamere, 1.6 grams three times per day with meals. And this was also started just prior to the dialysis start and was ongoing. There was no calcium substitution and uh, dialysate calcium, uh, this is hemodialysis, was 1.5 millimoles per liter. So at this point, we have a patient with osteoporosis on uh, DEXA. You saw her laboratory, uh, quite well controlled CKD MBD, except for an increased phosphate. And she is uh, under workup for transplantation and uh, she has no history of fractures of her own or family history of fractures. Here are some questions for the panel. Thank you, Matthias, for this first uh, introduction of the case. So I think these are very clear questions. We do just a quick round of the panelists to see whether they can address these, these questions very briefly before we have a more extensive discussion later on. So Anna Karina, can you comment these questions and briefly, I mean, uh, uh, yes. argue why you have this or that answer? Okay, yes, sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be here uh, contributing to, the, to this e seminar. So, um, about the question should this patient receive primary fracture prevention therapy? Um, I would definitely um, tell the patient to uh, adopt some lifestyle changes uh, to stop smoking, for instance. Uh, also, to do some exercise, uh, I would uh, like to, to have the patient on um, intradialytic exercise, for instance, if the patient couldn't do it uh, by her own. Um, it's important to have uh, um, bearing exercise for, uh, the, for the increasing in the bone volume. Um, the optimization of treatment of CKD MBD is almost performed. So, um, in this part, I, I don't think uh, um, it is. Uh, we could do much more. Yeah, we we can uh, talk to, to the patient to decrease um, the to do some diet because of the the phosphate or to um, to 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 do the the. Um, um, the, the phosphate uh, calents because um, Sablamar, I don't know how is the uh, how is she doing if she is actually doing uh, the two pills three times a day and uh, I would also uh, would like to know how uh, are the 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels of the patient um, nevertheless uh, I would definitely uh, would uh, calculate the frax uh, risk before adding uh, some more um, um, therapy to the patient. Thank you. Uh, Renata, anything to add? Well, thank you. Now, this was a very elaborate uh, answer. And uh, thank you, Matthias, also for introducing this interesting case and asking me to participate in this panel. Um, that from the view of the endocrinologist, uh, well, we are also looking at other factors like fall risk, for example, uh, because you are talking here already about primary factor prevention therapy, uh, but we first need to make this estimate of this fracture risk. And I think fall risk is also a very important component of uh, estimating this fracture risk. So I think you should always ask for falls false number of falls in the final year last year uh, and one of the other things I was wondering about because you said about the DEXA scores and no fractures in her past history 
but was there also vertebral factor assessment made? Uh, because I think always there is an indication. If you have the indication for the DEXA measurement, there is always an indication to do also a vertebral factor assessment because they are highly prevalent and they are mostly asymptomatic um, uh, or not very specific in symptoms. Uh, so it, it adds to also this estimation of the 10-year factor risk. So I think for now, that are the two most important things I would like to add. Thank you. And Sandro, something to add from your side? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Matthias, for your presentation. Um, I would adhere to the third uh, possibility, that's your the third answer that you gave to the question lifestyle changes and uh, uh, addition of both specific terms. However, I would say that uh, in this case, it has been, uh, uh, the, the DEXA score has been tested before the FRAX score, which is not necessarily the case. Uh, since these patients are old, are old she is a woman and uh, she has a CKD, she should be uh, uh, assessed for FRAX score even before performing a DEXA, uh, whose value could more directly give information for the possibility of choosing any therapy. Uh, another point, uh, I noticed that uh, there is no assessment of 25D, uh, which could be also evaluated directly by direct assessment, uh, or indirectly by making some uh, clinical evaluation because it is possible to identify patients with an elevated risk of uh, vitamin D deficiency simply watching at the lifestyle at some uh, uh, clinical risk that are commonly associated. And uh, if I can add uh, a final point, uh, in this patient where born uh, specific alkaline phosphatase is not available, I used to watch the ratio between the actual value of the patient and the upper uh, value of the test you are using. In this way, in this case, it is possible to uh, calculate that uh, uh, going from 1.2 to 1.3 means an increase of the ratio from 0.6 to 0.8 which is a significant change. And if uh, the patient is not having any liver disease, uh, you can assume that there is something uh, going on, uh, possibly wrongly, in the board. Okay, thank you for this uh, very additional and in, uh, interesting additional information. Uh, before we move to the, the next part of the case, uh, Matthias, I would also like to ask you something. So sometimes we're dealing with, um, let's say, inconsistent DEXA results in a way that the lumbar spine is within the normal or osteopenic range or even normal, and you find osteopenic range for other sites. It's how to deal with this discrepant, let's say, uh, findings at different sites of the DEXA that you are evaluating. And within the same sense, also in this case, you only measured the DEXA at the lumbar spine and the total hip. Why not at, for example, the radius? Well, thank you very much, all four of you, for these comments and also for the questions. Uh, I. I do agree with all of you, and I can um, comment uh, a few of the points you raise. Um, first, I could say that 25-hydroxy-D uh, is definitely something that would be interesting to see in this patient. At the time when this patient was uh, uh, presenting, which is a few years ago, uh, in our unit, we did not uh, check 25-hydroxy-D uh, in dialysis patients. So this was not done in this case. Maybe today it would be different. Um, then uh, I would also like to comment on the, the question of um, FRAX versus DEXA. So I do definitely agree. Uh, a clinical fracture risk assessment tool is valuable because it's very quickly done. You can just do it while you meet the patient. 
uh, and it can give you some very valuable information. And this was also uh, demonstrated uh, in, in clinical studies showing that uh, the fracture risk prediction is about the same with uh, um, fracs in dialysis patients as in non-dialysis patients. However, there are some divergent results in different studies. So uh, it is a tool that may still not be exact, but it is valuable in giving us uh, a hint. Uh, and then if you have a high risk on FRAX, uh, it may be valuable to go on with DEXA. In this case, DEXA was not done to primarily evaluate the current fracture risk, but this was done as part of the transplant workup. So it was a complete routine uh, examination without any um, without any clinical uh, question, really, more than uh, should this patient have uh, osteoporosis treatment while on high dose steroids. Um, now, uh, the question, Peter, about the divergent uh, DEXA results. This is, of course, very interesting. And in the case where you have in a, in a dialysis patient who already, like this patient, has some signs of uh, vascular disease, you could, of course, um, think that maybe um, a, a higher lumbar spine DEXA could be due to vascular calcification. Um, uh, personally, I would say uh, it is always important to look at the lowest DEXA results because they give you uh, information about where the bone is um, the weakest. Um, why was not uh, the radius tested in this patient? The patient followed a standard uh, protocol. And uh, if both lumbar spine and uh, the hip are uh, uh, evaluable, then we do not go on in these uh, routine DEXAs with uh, radius. But, Renate, as you say, we routinely uh, check for uh, vertebral fractures in, uh, in CKD patients from CKD3 downwards. Uh, so in this case, also uh, a VFA was done. Sorry. Um, VFA was done, but uh, there was no indication of uh, a vertebral fracture. Okay. So I, I just would, yeah, I would like to add, Matthias, a little bit of disagreement concerning the uh, the impact of, of uh, calcification of the aorta on the lumbar spine dexa. So we recently uh, did very, I mean, in-depth evaluation of the, the impact of vascular calcification on the lumbar spine, so the anterior posterior lumbar spine image, and it's it's minimal. So, I mean, the, the widespread belief that this is really affecting your lumbar spine BMD to a great extent, that's that's not what that's not right. So it has an, a, a minimal impact, but certainly not a clinically relevant impact. So lumbar spine data are very well trusty uh, also in, in CKD patients, even if they are calcified. Yeah, that's very interesting, Peter. And uh, but still, I would say that uh, the lowest DEXA should still be. Yeah, uh, and I, I completely agree with that statement. Yes, yes, that should be the case. Sandra, did you have a final uh, comment because you raised your hand? Your your oh, micro. Sorry, I forgot yeah. to point out that this patient, while on PD, was receiving a, a low calcium dialysate which could have been a possible cause of negative calcium balance during the period of PD. And in hemodialysis, it would be nice to have data on the amount of ultrafiltration, because if the percentage of ultrafiltration is high for this patient, there could be an added condition of negative calcium balance in, in dialysis. Very okay. good. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that information avail available here, but it's a very, very good point. Yeah. Renata has a, another yeah, comment. I, I may just add to that per very good point that it's always also important to ask about the intake of calcium, of course, for this calcium balance, because this patient only has non-calcium containing phosphate binders and no calcium supplementation. So that also needs to be part of the inventorization of the calcium balance, I think. 
So does, does she take any dairy products? Very good. Um, so usually in these patients with high phosphate, difficult to treat, we recommend the patients to avoid at least cheese um, and reduce dairy products. Uh, this patient could very well have received these recommendations. It's it's quite common to do that. So uh, I do agree there may be a risk uh, that this patient had too low calcium intake. And uh, a few years ago, when this patient presented, uh, we were very careful with calcium substitution uh, generally. So we had some reviews, very interesting reviews, uh, telling us not to give calcium uh, containing phosphate binders and so on. So, so uh, maybe this case is reflective of a certain period in time and the way we treated patients at that case. But may I go on with the case? Uh, so before you do, Matthias, just one quickly more. I think I, I think we cannot under I mean estimate the importance of calcium intake, and so I I certainly would uh, recommend everyone to go to this uh, recommend to this consensus paper on calcium because one of the main conclusions is that we as nephrologists should more evaluate the calcium intake in our patients, and we'll have a surprise by finding many cases very low calcium intakes. So no, Matthias, please, um, you can continue. Thank you. So at that time, um, we did go on with the FRAX, uh, just as Karina recommended. And um, we found a major osteoporotic fracture risk within the next 10 years of 21% and a hip fracture risk of 12%. Um, after fracture risk assessment, uh, the patient was recommended lifestyle changes, but no bone-specific treatment was started, which means no anti-osteoporotic drugs were started. Due to continued hyperphosphatemia, D-vitamin was still withheld and Sivelamer was continued. Eight months later, the patient experienced a sudden sharp lower back pain while turning in bed. She was sent to an x-ray and uh, a compression fracture of vertebrate L1 and L2 were diagnosed. At that time, PTH was 28.9, which is um, about four to five times upper normal limit, more than more four than five. Uh, calcium was 2.21, which is a little bit lower than before, but still within normal limits. Phosphate had come down a little bit to 1.5 millimoles per liter, which we would accept as uh, within the therapeutic range. Alkaline phosphatase had increased to 2.1 microcut per liter. And here the upper limit of normal is 1.9. So what should be the next step? Okay, thank you. So I think we now have the time to go do another round um, and address these questions to all panelists. And then also certainly we'll raise questions from the audience because in between there's many, many questions being dropped in the box. So we'll have, we'll need some time to also address these questions. But first, uh, please, uh, Anna Karina, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, the next step, so we have a, a patient with a FRAX uh, risk, uh, a high risk uh, patient for a major osteoporotic fracture because the, the FRAX risk was 21. And so she's 72 years old, is postmenopausic, and uh, we probably should uh, do some bone specific treatment. But uh, this patient is uh, on dialysis, she has CKD-MBD, so before that, uh, I would recommend to do a bone biopsy to guide treatment. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I've, the, the bone biopsy gives a, a static information of what happens to the bone in this specific time. Um, and to have a more, um, uh, a more um, 
uh, idea about the evolution of the the the, the patient uh, of the bone of the patient, we could uh, do um, again a DEXA uh, densitometry to see how is uh, the patient is going if she is losing rapidly uh, bone uh, volume or or or, or not. Um, uh, also. Because the patient uh, had a, a fracture, maybe we should uh, get, get her uh, in between uh, native vitamin D and about uh, the calcium. Um, I think there are other alternatives to phosphate binders uh, that is not um, not only with uh, calcium carbonate, but also with calcium acetate and magnesium carbonate. And maybe this could be... Uh, uh, I think to 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 start or to to think about it. So my question, my answer would be the three, uh, the third, um, the third line. Yeah, and then the the vision of the endocrinologist. Uh, thank you, Peter. I completely agree with Anna. I would also uh, actually renew the DEXA to to have a baseline value before you start a therapy because she truly has an indication now to do something as she has incident vertebral fractures so that's it's really a reason to do something um uh, and i it's also quite small because within the endocrinology field of course i see a lot of osteoporosis and normally when people refracture within a year of the dexa you don't repeat the dexa because the dexa changes are very slowly but that's in osteoporosis. But of course, in CKD, there can be anything going on. It may be osteomalacia. And osteomalacia, for example, is a uh, uh, that can develop very quickly also on a DEXA. So if there is like osteomalacia, you will see a very low BMD on the DEXA. And it does not indicate osteoporosis, but it can change really quickly. So in these patients, I would repeat the DEXA anyway, if they have a fracture. Yeah, uh, so uh, that's one thing. And I also wanted to indicate that the alkaline phosphatase was elevated, as Matthias said, but she just had to fracture. Uh, and you should always be aware of the interpretation of the bone turnover markers very quickly after a fracture, because, of course, they are influenced up until six months after an uh, incident fracture uh, by the fracture itself. They increase. So... It does not tell us much actually about the bone turnover now. Um, so that, that for that you need a longer follow-up uh, or a bone biopsy. And in this case, I would really prefer to, to do the bone biopsies because we don't want to wait with incident for, for tubal fractures. All very important comments. Uh, thank you, Renata. Sandro? Okay. Uh, if we, if she, uh, if she was uh, normal renal function subject, we should start immediately anti-resorptive therapy, anti-osteoporotic therapy. But she, since she is a sick patient with, with long story of renal insufficiency, I think we should go for a bone biopsy to guide the treatment. Indeed, there are two elements that we should watch at in particular. One is the, the increasing value of alkaline phosphatase that if we evaluate as a ratio of uh, value of the patient to the total upper limit uh, has changed from uh, 0.6 to 1.1 progressively during the observation, indicating that something is occurring in bone. This is mostly due to uh, bone alkaline phosphatase because the patient uh, uh, it is not said, but she's not presumed to have any liver disease. And uh, uh, this means that we are having some difficulties in mineralization, uh, uh, or there may be some degree of osteomalacia, or there can be a very high turnover that is increasing in bone. Uh, accordingly, we should have a watch at PTH values, which are increasing a little bit, and finally, I think it would be helpful to watch uh, the values of, of acid-base balance because uh, this patient uh, uh, is in dialysis and she maybe she is not well nourished or she does not uh, receive uh, possibly uh, uh, enough uh, uh, amount of bicarbonate during dialysis. So I think this 
should be the first approach before deciding which possible therapy, uh, which uh, obviously as a baseline therapy, I would recommend any native vitamin D in order to have normal values and uh, would be necessary to watch a calcium balance, as we said before. Thank you, Sandra. And also this brings me to one of the questions in the in the box. So one of the people asked indeed about uh, acid-base status, which is sometimes an, an uh, neglected issue. Uh, we don't uh, take care of it uh, uh, too, I mean, too little in many cases. So have you any data about the uh, sodium bicarbonate levels and... Uh... Uh, yes, uh, so thank you everybody for the for the valuable uh, comments. So the acid base status in this patient was uh, well controlled. Um, with um, we only look at the uh, uh, standard bicarbonate, uh, which was well above twenty. Uh, the patient was not alkaline. Um, and uh, now let's see. There, yes, so there was a comment about the alkaline phosphatase, which I think was very, very good. Uh, when you have a patient who just had a fracture, the alkaline phosphatase can be increased or will be increased. But in this case, the alkaline phosphatase was already increased before the fracture, which was uh, not indicated on the slide. I, I agree. So, so much as would, would other bone biomarkers also be of interest? I mean, we always refer to alkaline phosphatase as potentially also indicating osteomalacia. Could could uh, the analysis of other bone biomarkers be of help in, in this, making distinction between uh, osteomalacia and, for example, a, a high bone turnover? Is there any data? That's a difficult question uh, that you ask. Uh, so... Um... I would say, Peter, that, uh, well, uh, let me say, uh, uh, I'm not aware of that literature. There certainly is literature, uh, but I'm not aware if there are any any bone markers that you could use clinically uh, as a tool to distinguish between, um, between high bone turnover and uh, osteomalacia. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> personally, I believe that uh, there are no good indicators of a mineralization defect in a clinical patient. Uh, so even the alkaline phosphatase could be, as you say, a high because of um, because of osteomalacia or because of high bone turnover. Um, there also is, of course, a, a, a limitation as to what uh, bone markers you can use. Uh, I think the most common clinical bone markers are bone alkaline phosphatase and CTX. And the CTX is um, lim has limited uh, function in patients with CKD or since it is uh, uh, renally cleared. Uh, of course, you could say, and maybe if you take it serially in a, in a, a dialysis patient without residual renal function, it may have some value, but, but still the value is limited. So mm -hmm. we do not check CTX in these patients. Okay, before we move, I have another very, let's say, interesting question to you and the whole panel uh, from Maria jesus Loret, And she's asking, I mean, Taking a bone biopsy, it's nice and well, but it also takes time. I mean, organizing the bone biopsy, getting the result back, it's something sometimes taking weeks to months uh, even. So why then we're losing a lot of, I mean, very costly time because uh, time is money also in fracture risk prevention. So how to balance this? I mean... Very good question. You want to ask it to the... Yeah, whole you, you could start and you could start, I Matthias. Start? Okay. So I definitely agree. Number one, uh, we we have a patient with clinically relevant fractures, two uh, serial um, um, vertebra, vertebral fractures. So there is a strong indication for treatment um, and uh, that could probably be something that we could uh, consider. However, if we uh, believe, if we do have indication that the patient could have a mineralization defect, I think uh, we should be careful with starting on anti-resorptive treatment, since uh, that, that would be a relative contraindication. Other panelists, anything to add or you agree? 
Well, I, I, I think that's a very good point made, actually. Um, and I agree with Matthias that when you have an, you should make a, like risk estimation on the base of all the clinical and biochemical and imaging you have uh, uh, about the, uh, well, how high and how likely it is that there is this mineralization defect. Um, or like completely adenemic bone. Um, I, I think that's the thing you want to estimate. And it depends, of course, on how quickly you can have this bone biopsy done. And the, not having the availability of a bone biopsy should not uh, uh, make you not treat this patient. I mean, this patient should be treated. Yeah. So, 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 Renat. So, if in the case, because I would say eighty to ninety percent of all nephrologists do not have access to bone biopsy in a way, so what would you recommend then? Would you then go ahead with treatment, even if there is a slightly risk of missing osteomalacia? So, how would you balance? It's very difficult in this case. I agree, uh, but if there, if you're quite sure about the calcium and D balance, that it's okay and fine. If there's no other clinical risk factor to have this osteomalacia, and in this case, I'm not convinced, uh, so I would not dare to do it straightforward in this case and to resorptive therapy. Uh, but but if and it's very, I, I, I do not have a clear cut answer to this question because that's a very difficult one. And, and why not just treat them also for osteomalacia, but also, I mean, do the, the two of them, I mean, treat them for osteomalacia and giving an antiresorptive, for example. Yes. Is, this, is this an but option? You, or? It is an option, but you should, I mean, we can just check the vitamin D levels, the 25 vitamin D. You should know it before you start antiresorptive treatments. And that that's really, because otherwise you will have problems with hypocalcemia if it's really low. Uh, so you should wait for that. Uh, but mm -hmm. afterwards, uh, if, if they are fine and there is enough calcium intake uh, and you don't have a bone biopsy nearby you can do, then then yes, then I would sometimes take the risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So everyone is waiting for what's next, uh, Matthias. Okay. Go so ahead. Let's go on. Um... So the clinical course after the fragility fracture was uh, a new DEXA was done and we saw a, a massive uh, decrease of uh, bone mineral density at the total hip. Uh, the uh, T-score was now minus 3.7 and at the lumbar spine, it was minus 1.9. Uh, and the clinicians decided for an iliac crest bone biopsy after double tetracycline labeling. Uh, and this labeling is, of course, uh, important uh, to see the dynamic uh, of the bone turnover. Uh, while waiting for the biopsy results, which of course take weeks to months, the patient was started on alpha calcidol and calcium carbonate and alpha calcidol dose was 0.25 micrograms. I'm sorry for the mistake here uh, per day and uh, 500 milligrams uh, car calcium carbonate per day. Um, then unfortunately, a lot of things happened. So the patient suffered a cerebrovascular insult and a myocardial infarction almost simultaneously. Uh, when a coronary angiography was done, uh, a calcified occluded left coronary artery was seen. Also, the right coronary artery was calcified but open. The patient had an aortic valve stenosis with calcifications, and also uh, the carotids were calcified and uh, abdominal aorta and iliac artery. So she was heavily calcified. Her laboratory at that time was PTH 18.2 picomoles per liter, which is uh, a lower value than before. This was after starting her on uh, vitamin D and calcium. Her calcium was 2.1 millimoles per liter. 
the phosphate had come down to 1.2 millimoles per liter, and alkaline phosphatase was also lower at 1.5 microcats per liter. So then we received the bone biopsy results, and maybe I can ask Karina to give us an interpretation. Yeah, sure. So at the right, um, we see um, the decalcifier bone biopsy. This um, between the blue lines, it's fat with a with a um, with, with a white uh, circles. It's fat, and uh, the blue um, thing, it's a uh, it's bone. It's the trabecular bone. We can see that in all these trabecular surface there is um, something colored in red that is the uh, non-mineralized bone uh, which is a little bit increased but not so much uh, but uh, the surface uh, in all the the trabecular it's not very used uh, it's not the thing that we uh, usually see uh, on the left uh, panel, uh, we see the immunofluorescence with the tetracycline labels, and we can see that the, at the right there is one uh, double label, uh, but it's, it's somehow blurred, um, and it's 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 not very. If the patient has a high turnover, we would see much more than this, and also in in uh, the bone, not only in on the surface. It's the oldest ones. So uh, I would say uh, that um, there is a few double labels that the um, osteoid tissue is a little bit increased, but not so much. But there is a, a, a lot of osteoid uh, along all the trabecular surface. Nevertheless, uh, we don't have here the cortical bone, which is also very important for assessing the fracture risk. Yes, thank you. So I will go on directly to the results that we received by the pathologist, and maybe you can also comment the numbers. Okay, so the bone area is, uh, are, is uh, in the normal um, range. Uh, and as I would say, the osteoid perimeter is very high, 70%. And uh, the osteoid uh, thickness, it's... Um, it's normal. It's uh, uh, in the normal range, although very, uh, very near the upper limit. Uh, we also see that mineralization lag time. Uh, it, it is three times above the normal. Uh, so this patient needs three times more uh, to mineralize uh, her bone. Uh, and uh, uh, the bone formation rate is normal, but normal low, I think. Um, so this would be the things that I rapidly would look for. And uh, the comments uh, are okay. Bone formation rate, it's low normal. Osteoid area is increased and few osteoblasts. I, I didn't see any osteoclast in the bone uh, biopsy before. Um, mineralization parameters are increased, but this is not an osteomalacia, but, uh, but there is a abnormality uh, in mineralization, but not uh, uh, osteomalacia diagnosis. Thank you very much. Um, so with this, I would like to give the panel the clinical questions, what to do next. Thank you, Matthias. Um, I think this is um, all relevant, uh, important questions, but also not easy. Um, so who is the first to address? I would say again, uh, starting from uh, Sandra now. So Sandra, could you comment on the on the clinical questions, please? Yes, if I can give some comments on uh, the, the pictures of the bone biopsy. Yes, I for sure would also underline that uh, in that trabecular, maybe that is a single trabecular, but uh, there were there was no area of resorption. And uh, all, the whole surface of the trabecular was covered by some osteoid or unmineralized bone. So uh, 
this is a condition. And uh, finally, there is also one other thing. There was no sign of uh, uh, medullar uh, fibrosis, which is a, a sign of severe hyperparathyroidism. So as a whole, I would consider this case as a case of uh, hyperosteoidosis, which uh, can resemble a condition in which there is a, a long lasting, but not that severe condition of delayed mineralization of bone. Uh, and I think that uh, also the uh, turnover parameters that have been uh, shown to us uh, could uh, uh, agree with this uh, point of view. So I think it is important to try to improve uh, the most uh, the, 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 the phenomenon of mineralization in this patient, watching at possible causes, for example, malnutrition, which is frequently a case in this patient, and uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, being sure that there is enough uh, calcium balance uh, and uh, uh, there are no other problems with the mineralization. We said that uh, acid base is good, so this is not the case, but I think that's the first thing to try to do. Okay. Um... And can I also add one thing that uh, an idea because one question was if you cannot have the bone biopsy yes. how can you try to distinguish between uh, hyperparathyroidism and osteomalacia i think that uh, going to back a few years uh, i would rely on standard x-rays of the bones trying to find if there are any sign of osteomalacia or if there are prevailing signatures of uh, reabsorbing uh, hyperparathyroidism. And that could be, uh, obviously, it is not that precise, but could be helpful in some patients. Okay, Renat, could you comment on, on treatment of this specific case? So we have now a problem, uh, how to face it? Because osteomalacia, it's not formal osteomalacia, at least it's a starting mineralization defect in a patient presenting with, I mean, uh, important I fracture. In this case, I think the first thing to do is uh, continue with calcium and vitamin D, but trying to verify if the amounts of vitamin D is sufficient. And yeah. uh, if you have some degree, I think the PTH is not that high, uh, and it, it seems to be responsible to the small doses of alpha calcium. So that could be good, but uh, uh, I'm afraid that could be the baseline of therapy and then, uh, because there are there may be concerns with the uh, treatment with bisphosphonates and other drugs in this dialysis patient, uh, thinking to the nosumab or, or parathyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. So, because in dialysis we have not that much data. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the, I mean, the, the diagnostic criteria of osteomalacia and some units not having access to bone biopsy. Uh, there's a question from the uh, from the audience asking whether there are safe levels of alkaline phosphatase or bone specific alkaline phosphatase that could rule out osteomalacia. So, negative predictive values. I mean, any data about it, Matthias? Do you have any? I mean, uh, data about uh, what level do you use the cutoff? No, I, I am sorry, but I do not know any any specific. Cutoff. I'm not aware of any study, but I think this really relevant question of and again should help us in the future to to try out and to figure out if there's if there is indeed some kind of a cutoff level that could help us in in excluding uh, osteomalacia. I think let's not. If I just can give a short comment, so if we look at the literature in CKD MBD. Uh, covering mineralization defects of this kind, we can say uh, that there's very, very few publications looking at this. So yeah. uh, this is definitely something we should do. Because it's also, I mean, again, the prevalence of osteomalacia, if you look at the big registries, is really limited in a way. So it's it will be hard to, to have really good uh, data about it. And another point is, of course, this was a Caucasian a Swedish patient. Um, did you ever thought about uh, aluminium or, or, or iron uh, deposition? 
Uh, no, aluminium has not been present in bone biopsies in Sweden for a long, long time. So, so that's uh, we never thought about that. Iron deposition is more interesting, and there's some new data coming on that. Uh, in this case, uh, there was no iron deposition. Okay. In the biopsy. Good. Anyone else to comment on the on the treatment? So we have. I mean, we said we should uh, try to get his 25D levels within the normal, even above normal range, uh, give sufficient calcium. Uh, anything else? So none of you would, would uh, start with anti-resorptive agents in combination with this, this uh, vitamin D and calcium supplementation? No, I, I would not do that. Uh, on the yeah. base, actually, on the bone biopsy results, yeah, because you practically don't see any osteoclasts. Yeah. Uh, uh, so what are you doing with anti-resorptive treatment in this case? And I think it's when you're looking at the biopsy that may be uh, like not a very, it's not a large mineralization defect, but it's uh, there has been abnormal mineralization for quite a long time actually, yeah. I think. And that may be just the underlying uh, cause. Uh, so, but there is a thing about uh, active vitamin D supplementation. I think you as nephrologist may, because she was withheld uh, an increase in active vitamin D supplementation before because she has high phosphate levels. And it, it, that may be a thing because uh, now she has a little bit of, in the end, she had a little bit of alpha-calcidol supplementation at normal phosphate levels. So there may be still some uh, space to increase you have some uh, um, yeah you can increase it a little bit perhaps but she has all this vascular calcification so that may be something that with with health yeah with health that's for increasing as well mm -hmm. yeah. oh there are more questions, uh, Peter. Yeah, I think one of the, the the issues that struck me mostly is the is the uh, massive decrease in the T score that you have seen. So this quick decrease, and like you nicely uh, told us and teached us, uh, Renata, this is pointing to osteomalacia because you won't see such a, a rapid decrease in the T score over nine or eight months, and and if you see a rapid decrease, also having your mind osteomalacia, and I think this case prove this is something that we really should uh, take into account. So how, how would you monitor therapy? I mean, so you start 25D, you start phosphate, uh, you start calcium supplementation. So what would you suggest? Uh, when would you do a, a repeat TEXA scan in this patient? I, I would do it after six months, actually, to see in which direction we are moving. And as you said, you can see changes very quickly. In six months, you may see changes. Uh, so, so that helps you if it increases uh, the T-score. And also, of course, the bone turnover markers may help you uh, because uh, only you we have this incident fracture interfering with the interpretation of our bone turnover markers because it's, they don't only increase the alkaline phosphatase, but also incident fractures, of course, increase also the other bone turnover markers as the trimere P1 and P and other bone uh, markers. Mm -hmm. But I would follow them up anyway, because if they increase, something is going wrong <laughs> with yeah. the therapy. Yeah. I think we have to close it because we always, I mean, you see this very active discussion. There's many questions in the box we were not able to address, but also I need to emphasize some of them were not directly linked to this case. And I can tell you, uh, don't be afraid. There will be many more cases come. And we'll certainly will be able to address these questions with uh, future cases. Again, good news is there's other cases that will be present in the near future. You can find the dates on this uh, slide. Please mark your agenda. Would be very pleased if we could welcome you again. Also, please already mark your calendar for the 7th UDOT winter meeting uh, scheduled in January 17 to the 19th, with the central theme will be inflammation. We didn't discuss this inflammation in this case, but also inflammation could be really like a silent killer of bone in a way and also promote vascular calcification. So please mark your agenda. 
Having said this, I would like to thank the uh, presenter. I would like to also thank all the panelists for a very fruitful discussion. I'm also thanking you for attending this meeting. And I can also tell you that, of course, everything is recorded. So if you want to go back and look at the discussion again, or people that uh, were not able to attend the whole of this meeting, it will be um, rec it's recorded and it will be put on the server of the ERA, where you can have a look at it again uh, once more if you think this is of uh, interest to your practice. So thank you all, and uh, we keep in touch. Thank you.